do you ever feel lonely in your relationship? Like you just want to be understood. You just want to be gotten. You just want to connect. Well, if you are feeling any sense of loneliness in your marriage today is the show for you. We have an amazing woman, Ellie, who's going to talk to us about her problems and her issues with loneliness in her marriage. And we've got answers. Stay tuned. Okay, ladies, this is an amazing show because I get this, I get a lot of emails about this. Right now, type in, are you lonely in your marriage? And do you want answers? And some of the feelings that you might be feeling with it because loneliness also comes with abandonment and all kinds of sad emotions that we want to cover. And we've got answers. Our Masora, 3,000 year old track record of history that will fill your heart. That's what we're here to do today. And what I want to do first is go over, explain to you Ellie's situation. So I spoke with a very deeply, very special woman, very, wants to have an awesome marriage, like, you know, wants to feel close, wants to not feel lonely, wants to feel uh, like she's with, with her full partner, with her husband. And that's what we're going to work on today. That's, that's hopefully by the end of today, when she walks away, she, all of us will feel a, a, a whole new sense of hope and action plan for exactly how to solve this issue. Okay, so here's the story. Ellie has been married for 11 years. She's got three kids. And she, I'm going to look down because I'm going to tell you some of her exact words. She said, the basic problem in our marriage, the basic issue is we're complete opposites. He's very, you know, I'm the emotional creative type. And, you know, I'm, I'm uh, busy, you know, um, uh, uh, thinking of new ideas. And my husband is the organized logical type. And he totally doesn't get me at all. Like, I, I feel like, you know, when we first got married, he'd walk in the door and the house wouldn't be absolutely pin perfect. You know, this is even before we had kids. He expected me to have everything perfectly tidy, organized, and he wouldn't, there was no excuse that I could say that would solve him, that would make him feel like, okay, this is all right, you know, whatever. Okay, I get it. He didn't get it. He we went through a year of therapy and after that, thank goodness, he sort of learned to not take it personally and learned not to sort of uh, uh, take it out on me. You know, but I was there scrubbing the counters and trying to, you know, tidy up and I was making myself crazy and it really cre created a boundary between, between us, uh, which still hasn't gone away. I mean, I still feel like they, that huge difference between his logic and my emotions just don't compute. A couple of the other things she said, um, he gives no validation to my feelings. So I'll tell him, you know, this is upsetting me. This is whatever. And he goes, that's your issue. Deal with it. Solve it yourself. You need to solve it. That has nothing to do with me. Solve it. You know, so I feel like he doesn't validate where I'm coming from. He doesn't. Uh, it's not like he doesn't care because he does. He's a very diligent. I'm, I'm now reading what her said. He's a dil diligent person and he works hard on himself and he's introspects and so forth. But does he, you know, he feels like he's working on himself. I'm working. I, my responsibility is to work on myself. I don't feel like there's teamwork there and it makes me feel very lonely. Um, OK, let me just make sure I've covered everything she said. Uh, she says, I, I, I feel like he doesn't understand where I'm coming from. I've worked uh, you know, and she said that the main thing I've worked so, so hard on not needing him like that. I, I, I really done everything to not need him because I find I, it just makes me too vulnerable and I get too crushed. But the problem is when he is upset with me and when he is um, uh, disappointed in something I'm doing or the house is a mess or untidy and he's upset or whatever, it makes me so upset and he acts distant I almost can't function. I'm completely broken from it. This is Ellie's word. See, she's honest with me and told me exactly. And this is really valuable because, so she's sharing herself with us and these pains and difficulties and suffering that she's gone through so that all of us can have a breakthrough and work through it and get to the other side of it and learn what do we do so we don't feel lonely in marriage. Okay, he also said he doesn't trust me and my capabilities. He also says, I don't trust him. So he, my husband makes, ju you know, uh, my husband makes judgment calls in Jewish law that I know my father wouldn't agree with. So I, he gets angry with me because I keep stricter than him because I keep like my father kept. And I, it, it makes me anxious, my husband's leniencies. And I, so my husband's very upset with me that I don't trust him. Um, so I asked her, what did she accomplish in therapy? And she said that he, his, he lessened his demands of tidiness in the house and his crazy expectations of Ellie 
lessened. That is very good. I said, are you um, able to connect? And she said, yes. If This is Ellie talking now. She said, if I let my guard down when then and I'm more vulnerable, then we can connect. It makes me anxious, but if I'm brave enough and strong enough, we're able to connect at that time. And she said, I often feel very emotionally lonely. He just doesn't understand me. Um, and uh, let's see. That's it. Okay, fine. So th that's the basic story of Ellie's loneliness. And I'm going to bring her on the phone, on the line now. And we're going to hear, um, uh, we're going to introduce. So first of all, Ellie, welcome to the Ladies Talk Show. And I'm very grateful to you for sharing yourself with us so that we can all gain from it. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. I'm very excited. Okay, good. Very good. Okay, so uh, did I get everything right? Like you and I had a really heart to heart talk about it. I kind of tried to summarize it yeah. in my notes or whatever. Uh, I, I, did I get it right? And is there anything that I missed? No, I think it was good. That was good. Oh, yeah. yeah. A, a plus layer. Okay, fine. <laughs> All right. So that's the issue. Now I want I had a question for you that I'd been thinking about since we talked. There were two things. The homework I had given you is to think about, to do some self, um, what's the word I said? Self-explanation, self-examination, introspection, to see if there's anything that you might be doing to push your husband away. That was the main homework that I gave you from the time we talked to this morning. Were you able to see any insights? And I'll explain to everybody afterwards why I gave you that particular homework. So my question is, what were you able to see any anything that, um, any in your introspection? Were you able to see any reasons why you might be pushing your husband to um, uh, away from you? I'm not sure. You're not sure. Okay. All right. That's fine. Um, so the reason I was asking that question is because. It's not blaming the victim, but many times there's something that we're doing based on our past history that makes us recreate it. So one of the things that Ellie and I talked about is the fact that when she was a, a girl, she had a best friend for years and years and years. And from one day, to the next, the woman dropped, the, the girl dropped her as a friend. And so maybe she's afraid of getting hurt. You know, there's these things from our past. And that's very common, by the way. I've heard that maybe 50 times of, of girls doing that and, and um, inexplicably also so many. Um, but the there's often things from our past that have us recreate that sense of rejection or that familiarity of that un, unresolved emotion that can play out in our daily life. So that's for anybody who's watching you. It's it's a chance to think about what might have affected you from your past that is warping your current marriage. And it's not blame the victim. It's like it it's it's. It, in other words, just, we always have this expression, there's always something you can do. So when people feel totally hopeless and they feel like, oh, there's nothing I can do and I can't be better at this, I can't make it better and I've tried this and it's all his fault and blah, blah, blah. There's always one thing. Maybe it's talking to him nicer. Maybe it's making him, bring him ice cream every day. I don't know, but there's always one thing, one little thing some, you can do to change, change the dynamic a little bit, enough maybe to turn the whole thing around. So I wanna start first with discussing loneliness and what is loneliness. Um, because Leia, I just, I just want to jump in because, um, we're just getting a lot of, from um, Tour Anytime and on Facebook, um, Facebook live and Tour Anytime's live stream and our Facebook, um, people saying that she's not alone. Um, she should have abundant blessings that many others are feeling the same way in their own marriages. And it's very brave of her for coming on. You hear that Ellie? Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, that will warm your heart for years to come. You'll see, you'll think back on it and it'll it'll warm your heart and everybody who's watching should feel like your heart warmed that we're we're in this together and we do have answers because loneliness is such a um uh I think you're going to be very excited by the very first thing I'm going to say, which is the fact that Everyone thinks when you're newlywed that, you know, or even before, you know, you're that as soon as you marry, you're beshared and you're at the chuppah and you're married, your loneliness is gone forever. And it's not 
the case. It's That's a fantasy that we've made up in our mind. And I don't know why God created it in such a way for us to have loneliness. So maybe we'll, uh, we'll have, have um, uh, Rahmanus have um, uh, mercy on people who are alone, really alone and we'll say, oh, you know, they must be feeling lonely and we'll reach out to them more. I'm not sure why all of it, that's part of our, the human emotions and the human condition is feeling lonely. And part of the thing that makes it so tragic in marriage is that we fantasize, we think, we have an expectation that is fed to us since early, since we're the youngest, that we'll have a best friend, we'll have our husband, and we'll never feel lonely again, which means that the second we feel lonely, it's much more, it crushes us much more because that's, we're like, something's wrong. This is not how it should be. This is, you know, I shouldn't be lonely as my best friend. And it makes you feel 10 times more lonely. You know, the expression where they say, well, how does it go? Uh, the worst kind of loneliness is being in a room with 10 million, with 100 people. How, you know what I'm saying, Serena? How does it go? You don't know what I'm talking about. No, it's like, you know. The, the, I've never heard of it. I've never heard of it. I'm actually curious to know. Oh, yeah. No, it's something like uh, maybe one of our readers, uh, viewers will type it in, um, what the expression is. I, I never, uh, I've never been as lonely. The loneliest feeling you can ever feel is when you're surrounded by 100 people. Like, in other words, if you're lonely in 100 people, like that is, so it's like if you're lonely with your husband standing right there, it's that much more painful. By the way, Layoff, it's not a real quote. It sounded amazing. So we now can create it as a real okay. quote. <laughs> you know, okay. So, but the point is that what is so crushing is the having this huge expectation of not being lonely. This is the game changer, ladies, is that if you realize, oh, it's normal to be lonely in marriage sometimes. It's lonely to feel under, misunderstood. It's normal to feel like he doesn't get me. If you, un if you can sort of take that on as the reality, which it is, okay, because as you saw, Ellie, everyone's chiming and saying, I feel the same way. It's normal. It takes a lot of the sting away from what is wrong with my marriage. Like I feel lonely in my marriage. That must be really bad. No, feeling lonely in your marriage is normal. What do we do about it? We're going to get to, okay? But the first step is okay. to understand that that's a normal feeling. It doesn't mean something's wrong with your relationship. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with the marriage and with the, your, your future, okay? Yeah, this is a normal feeling. So what do we, uh, some of the things that we want to examine in terms of loneliness are misconceptions that we have about how we should feel, how we, what our husband should provide to us. So I want to get right, Ellie, to the heart of the sort of the source, the sort of fundamental uh, uh, issue that you said that is bothering you about your husband, which is that you're complete opposites and that you have a creative nature and emotional and feelings and your husband is more like a robot, more logical, right? So tell right. us a little bit about how that makes you feel. I guess it is, when we can't relate, it just makes me feel distant. When you can't relate, it makes you feel distant. So in, in what way? Distant, like you just feel like you, you can't connect? It's like I'm talking to someone who doesn't understand my language. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and they're critical of things that or we are expressing myself because they see it as wrong or unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Leia, it's so interesting because it's almost like from what, what she's like saying, it sounds like so much of meaning like just what we were saying about being lonely in a room with other people. And, and somebody did comment actually that they said that the quote that they know about it is that it's, it's better to be it's better to be alone than being with someone who makes you feel alone because when you feel alone it's such a horrible feeling but it almost sounds like because because when she's talking to him or sharing with him if he's not validating her or making her feel heard she's basically she sounds so she's almost second guessing if what she's upset about is even something to be upset about like i've had that if i'm talking to someone and i'm talking and i'm sharing my heart and they're not validating me, I suddenly start second guessing myself thinking, maybe I'm just 
you know, like, what's wrong with me? Maybe I, I, I need to fix myself. Is, I, mean, I mean, they don't see what I'm seeing. It really chips away at your, like, self-esteem. So mm-hmm. it must be so devastating. Ellie, do you have thoughts on what Sarit just said? She's... Yeah, I, I, I do identify with it. You what? I identify with that. Yeah, she identifies with it. with it. She identifies with it, yeah. Mm. So the, the, uh, let's just step back for a second. The key here is that there is a huge uh, expectations. A lot of this is expectations about what another person should be providing for us. So we have to understand mm-hmm. that that, you know, in the background, that the, that it's that the crazy idea that you know, that they should totally get everything, you know, whatever, and understand us and whatever, that there's that expectation is actually mistaken. And I'll explain to you what Hazal say about this, because we, uh, we know that, you know, God created a man in a certain way, and he created woman in a certain way, and everybody's different, and there's shades of gray, and I'm not going to stereotype blank, blank. However, <laughs> we do know that there are many, many sources that talk about the emotions of a woman, her Sarah, her, her um, women's intuition, her ability to sort of feel things in, in, in a communicative way, in communicative way, and an understanding and a feeling, and a, you know that, that that is a woman's purview. There are men who have aspects of that, as just as there are women who have aspects of more sort of male strengths and weaknesses, you know. But for the most part, this is how God created, and He made man much more logical and much more analytical. And there are many uh, 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 quotes that we have that talk about how a man should listen to his wife, but not do everything she says because she can be carried away with emotions. So while he always, always needs to consider what she says and hear what she says and think about what she says, he doesn't always need to take actions based on what she says because a woman is more emotional. Okay. So these are, you know, the ground that we walk on and uh, what a woman needs to understand is in you think about, because you have your children and why wouldn't have God, why would Ma, God give a mommy who is emotional? Like, oh, you know, don't uh, whatever him right now. He he had a tough day. He had to go a run in with a kid and, you know, and the woman's all touchy feely and with her kid and seeing, oh, he didn't eat as much as he ate yesterday. Maybe every woman's not like this. I'm not saying you have to be like this, but I'm just saying just there's a sensitivity there that a woman has that a man may not have. And the man will come along and say, go to your room. You didn't. Blah, 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 blah. You know, why would God do such a crazy thing? Why would he give two complete opposite natures and, and ha- put them in a house together and say, you live together and you create this family and you raise these children. Right. God, if he had wanted to blink his eyes, he could have made two logical uh, partners or two emotional partners. He could have made us that way. That would have, you know, you think he's he's incapable. He's not incapable of anything. So if he's created the world in this way, why? Why? Why would he do such a crazy thing? Well, obviously it's for the good. That has to be everything God does is for the good. So it has to be for the good. So Maybe it's a hoax and we don't understand it. We just do. And this is just the way God made it. But if, sometimes when you use your cycle, when you use your brain to think about why would God have wanted it this way, you can come up with some very potent answers. Maybe the best thing for that kid is to see that there's logic and there's emotion and they, you know, that they can harmonize together. Maybe the challenge in a marriage is to become more like your husband, be slight, learn logic from him. And maybe he needs to learn emotion from you. All of this is we have sources for everything I'm saying. This is why yeah. God has created it this way. It's not that something's wrong. And you, you said, I feel like I'm talking a different language and he doesn't understand me and he doesn't get me, right? My big question for you, Ellie, do you understand him and get him? You know, he probably is there. And the reason he doesn't want to engage is because why would I want to go into chaos? My life is very structured, very logical, right? I don't want to step into her chaos and her emotion and her feelings. Like it, it, your world is not attractive to him. By the same token, yeah. his cold world of being logical and everything's a matter of data and facts and no emotions and no feelings. Why would I want to go there? So there's yeah. this divide 
right? There is a natural divide of logic and emotion. And then there's a wall in between it. And nobody wants to go on each other's side. And I get it. No, I don't want to, you know, like that's how, that's the challenge. That's, that's the reality we were given. It's not Ellie. It's not your husband is this way. It's men were created one way. Women were created another way. How do we bridge that gap so that we can be close? So that's the challenge. And God gave us that particular challenge. And here's the beauty of it. When you do come together as such opposites, okay? There's nothing more opposite than the rain and the ground, you know? The rain, and, and the, when the rain and the ground join, there is a, 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 a joy that is available in the connection of opposites. And here, Hashem made us, you know, opposite natures, so to speak, Rather than being angry at your husband for being that way, turn to God and say, why? Why did you make him so logical? And then ask, Hashem, what can I learn from my husband that will make my life better, that will bring us closer, that will make me better able? When you're married for two decades and three decades, a woman is better able to use logic because she spent 30 years, 20 years with a logical being. She's growing. And a husband, right? It's true. When a husband, when a husband is, you know, he, he comes out of school and whatever, and he's all Mr. Logic and Mr. Whatever, and he prides himself because he's surrounded by men. He prides himself on how logical and think he uses his brain to solve problems and accomplish and be successful. And then he's got this creature to deal with. It's from another planet. Okay. After a decade or two decades or three decades of being influenced and hearing what she had to say about certain things. Now he's making a business decision. It doesn't look so black and white. He's like, you know, maybe the person, the reason that competitor did this is because they think I'm trying to compete with them. Let me make a phone call. Uh, hello. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I understand that you did this and whatever. Oh, it's because you got a better price from your vendor. You know what? I'm going to also use that vendor. Maybe we'll go together, buy the shipment together. We'll get a better price. I'm just saying, you know, a man will learn things. Look, it could be the other way also. You could have a more emotional husband and the wife could learn it. So I'm not being so stereotypical. But what I am saying is this is your opportunity to grow together, to grow more like him and him grow more like you. Now, let's talk about. So first of all, Le Leia, can I just um, interject as yeah. Connie on um, Hani on um, Torah Anytime's live stream. Firstly, she said, Leia, you are amazing. You have such good answers. Okay. <laughs> so shout out to you. Um, and she also wanted to ask um, Ellie, if you are two opposites, what attracted you to him in the first place? Okay, Ellie, you want to answer that? That's a good question. Um, I think I saw much more inner strengths in him. Um, that I valued, that I thought would be, um, it's what I wanted in building a home. I could see he'd be a brilliant father, a brilliant um, provider. He had a lot of Elah Torah values. So I definitely saw things that, that I valued and appreciated about him. Inner strength. I love that. Did that answer her question? Make sure from Hannah if that answered your question. If you have another one, just type it in. That's very good. So that inner strength, you know, it's it's kind of like a woman is a a man is a rock and a woman is a butterfly. In many cases, it may not be true in your relationship. You might be you might be the rock and the husband's the butterfly. I don't know. Uh, but it's it's kind of like a man is a rock and he's just there, and the woman's all over the place. And he's like, "Where are you going? What are you doing? What are you, you know?" Even though he might delight in it, okay. Uh, and a woman needs a place to land, and the you know the the butterfly can't sit there flying all over the place all day long. They have to land. Well, I need a butterfly yeah. uh, 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 um, a prop. <laughs> I'll leave it as a bell. <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, anyway, you, your, what you saw in him was the ro his rock. Oh, we have a rock. Sweet. My rock. I love these props. Okay. We have a rock. It's actually like a, a hidden key thing. <laughs> anyway, it's a rock. So the thing is, a husband is a rock and that 
taking from that strength rather than being angry that he is the way he is, that he's cold, unemotional, he doesn't get you, he doesn't understand you. Take pride and glee and joy. Like, like you said, that's what you attracted you to him is his strength of character. Um, so uh, when, whenever you find yourself, Ellie, in, down the road and you're just annoyed that he's not getting you, think to yourself, in return for him not totally understanding me perfectly, I have a rock. Okay, I'll settle for the rock. <laughs> you know? I really like what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I, I can appreciate it. I think it's not so much that I feel angry when he doesn't understand me. It's just so painful. Oh, yeah. Why is it painful? I feel so lonely. That is what feels so lonely. That he doesn't, I, doesn't... I can understand that he doesn't get it, but then I'm by myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he, there's two issues. The first issue I'm going to tell you is uh, I, the source for this is... Um, Actually, there's many sources for it, and I'm blanking on exactly where it's from. But there's you've heard the expression "make for yourself a chaver, a friend." And if you have yeah. to buy a friend, you know. So I think that women, especially newlyweds, you know, in the first five years of marriage, they think their husband should be everything. And now with COVID, husband is because a woman can't go see her friends. But, but why does it say so strongly "make a friend"? It's because you ha a woman has very deep and very deep emotional needs and many emotional needs. They're all over the place. She's this whole bucket of emotional needs. And she thinks that her husband should fulfill all of her needs. And the issue is a lot of those needs that a woman has, not a lot, half, but at least half, you know, or a third or something like a huge chunk of a woman's emotional needs need to be met by a friend. Now, a friend, best friends, are, you know, are a rel like a, a sister or a cousin that you're particularly close with, or sometimes even your mom. But there's one caveat. You must never, ever, ever complain about your husband. Not ever, not one time. Not once, never. It's like forbidden. Never complain about your husband. But you can say something like, I was very upset. Like, in other words, if you go to your husband, you say, I was very upset because, you know, when she was in school and the principal said this and blah, blah, blah. And your husband's going to be like, well, he deserved it. Well, he should have been, you know, get out, get to bed earlier on time and he should do his homework or whatever it is. Your husband's going to be very logical and approach it with data and facts and, you know, whatever. And he's probably right. And your husband's, you know, whatever, but he's totally not getting you. So you feel unvalidated and un, unheard, unconnected, you know, right? You go to a girlfriend and you say, oh, the, you know, my son was brought to the principal's office and I'm, you know, the principal said this, your friend is going to go, oh, I can't believe it. I'm so sorry that happened. You That must have felt awful. What a terrible thing. Why would he call your son in? Why didn't he call you first and tell you, hey, I think there's an issue and he should have done this and he should have done that. Now, if you have a good friend, they'll also eventually, after they hear you and commiserate and go down to the d depths of your pain with you, they'll help walk you out of that pit <laughs> and they'll say, you know, even though it was painful and if it happened to me, I would be rip-roaring upset, you know, but... The truth is maybe there's something to what the principal said. And maybe this is Hashem's way, God's way of, you know, focusing you and having you pay more attention to your child. Maybe, you know, they'll help you. It, it, it takes a wise person. So maybe your friend should be a Rebetzin or a, a clergy person or somebody um, more experienced or older than you. You know, that helps for certain things. Right. There, there are other people, you know, there's somebody who said, um, uh, it was a, a, a Rebetzin told me this maybe a decade ago that every woman needs needs three friends. She needs a friend who's older than and wiser than her to help her through things. She needs somebody sort of on her level, like a, 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 a uh, comrade, a, uh, a compatriot in you know, dealing with the same issues. So somebody who's older, who's dealt with a lot of the issues, somebody who's, who's on the same level and somebody younger who they can teach, who they can also have a friend, but be more of a mentor towards. So every woman should have those. Oh, three. Very nice. oh, it's gorgeous. And the issue is that when, when you have those bouts of loneliness, because your husband doesn't understand you, it's not, that's not a, a need 
that should be directed at your husband. That's a need that should be directed to one of these three women or a sister or a close friend. Again, if you have an issue with your husband, you need to discuss it with your husband or a therapist or a third party or something like that. If you have an issue with your husband that you want to talk to somebody, all issues that you have should be parsed out between your husband and your friend group. Yeah, there's a lot of noise coming. Uh, I, are you, um, uh, Ellie? Sorry, it's clicking and something. <laughs> I don't know. By the way, Hani, oh. Hani did say from Torah Anytime's live stream, she said, thank you so much, Ellie, for the answer. She, it's, it means a lot that she's opening up and that she responded to her answer. So she said, please let her know. Thank you. Thank it meant you. a lot oh, that, that you responded. That's great. You got that, oh, Ellie? Okay. Okay, good. So um, the, the issue is that a lot of the needs that a woman have, she, she has, she places on her husband, and her husband just really isn't capable of the kind of, you know, I, I have a friend who, when something happens to me, it doesn't matter how dumb it is or how dumb it seems, you know, I can call her up and say, I need you to just tell me, oh, you poor thing, okay? So I'll tell her the whole story, and at the end, she'll, with full emotion and full drama, she'll say, oh, you poor thing. You know, it was a stupid thing. Oh, I got a ticket, <laughs> and then after the ticket, the flat tire, and then, blah, 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 you know, it's like all this stuff that doesn't really matter. It's not a long-range thing. You know, the husband will say, well, you should have gotten your tires filled with air, and you should have filled up with gas, and you should have, you know, why did you blow the red light? You know, the guy just won't get it. Whereas a woman are like, oh, I can't believe it. You were so busy working, you know, driving carpool to this one and dropping this one and getting the groceries, I get it. And a woman will understand in a much, much deeper way. So, and those times when we feel lonely, a lot of it is because we're looking to the wrong person to fill that emptiness. And uh, so that should go a long way. Now, is it easy to develop friends? No. That's why it says in the Torah, make for yourself a friend, even if you have to pay for a friend. That means giving gifts, giving presents, making, you know, making extra, when you're making a, a kugels, uh, you make an extra one, you're making pies, you make an extra one. It means doing things, uh, uh, gifting them to make them like you so that they're there for you. You know, and my husband was, was once said that, that um, something about a, uh, a good friend is one where you lean, you know, it's not like you're always leaning on this person or they're always leaning on you, that it's kind of a match of, you know, when you are feeling needy or upset or whatever you call them, but it's not a one-way ticket. You're not always just leaning on them. Then when they're upset, they call you. So it's being the kind of person that is open to it and calling them and saying, how are you doing? You know, I, I heard, I, I saw that, uh, you know, and you didn't look so happy when I saw you in the grocery store. Is anyone seeing anyone with COVID? But anyway, whatever, you know, I saw you on Zoom and you didn't look happy or whatever, uh, you know, being there for the other person. So you try, it's, it's a whole avoda. It's a whole project and a whole learning curve to be able to be a good friend. And what you should do in your, in your, in your, in your life now is anyone who's watching just take an index card and write down who would you consider your friends you know and you know try and you only need two or three friends you know but who are your friends and are you as close to them as you'd like to be if the answer is no then spend more time with them figure out okay what am i going to do to increase my friendship with this one what am i going to do to increase with that one and then you'll say oh you know i'm going to call her a little bit more often then you find that you're calling her every week to see how she's doing and she never calls you then that's maybe not the best friend for you because you want to feel a sense of mutuality. So a lot of the loneliness that we have in marriage, and this is the upshot of this portion of this show, is a lot of it has to do with misguided loneliness from the wrong, we're looking for emotional support in the wrong place that a husband cannot give. Is that clear? I'm hearing you. Okay, now let me, I'm gonna to get to your husband. Did you have any questions on that before I get to that? I think it was just, is there ever a time when you can expect some kind of connection, friendship from your husband, even if he's not emotional? Yes. So the question was, it, 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 is there ever a ch time when you feel that emotional connection? Wait, what was the rest of the question? What, sorry? I'm saying, I, I want to feel that I can find a friend and I can get most of my emotional connection from a friend, but I want some connection with him. Meaning she doesn't want to have to, basically what, she, what I'm hearing is like, she's like, it's really nice to have that friend who I'm going to be able to turn to, but am I then not missing such a big part of what marriage is because I'm not having that with my husband? I remember this so clearly, Leah, 
Well, we were, when you were giving your classes um, locally at a friend's house and, and I remember you saying your husband needs to be your best friend and you need to tell him, right, that he's your best friend. You have to say, I'm your best friend. And I remember thinking, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Do I feel like he's my best friend? Meaning um, there's so, there were so many things I was grappling with. And I'm like, do I really feel like he's my best friend? I mean, I don't feel like I could say everything to him and I'm, I don't can't share everything with him. And, and it made me feel so sad that I was missing that like component. And so during those years of taking the class with you, I really worked hard on getting to that feeling of like, he's my best friend and I want to just spend time with him and talk to him. So I understand her like, not having that and saying, I'll just share with my friend and with him, I won't have that relationship. It kind of like takes away that best friend quality. Yeah, I totally hear that's great. Serena, it's great to have you around because you remember yes. what I said five years ago. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, that's, Leah, the, that's why I'm still around the, because it's done so much for my marriage. I'm like, I'm not leaving. You're stuck with me. <laughs> okay, so that's the part I wanted to get into now, which is, that connection and having your husband understand. And I'm going to, I'm going to go in a place that's a little uncomfortable, Ellie. Uh, I hope you'll forgive me, which okay. is that, you know, you say very pained. You say, I feel like he doesn't understand me. And my question for you is, do you understand him? Meaning, the whole way to turn this whole ship around to get him more connected to you is for you to go there. He's logical, you're uh, emotional, and there's a big wall in between. If you jump over the wall to, fear, see he, to understand where he is, to feel what he feels, to see things from his perspective, to try and get what is going on with him. You're so lonely and upset that he's not jumping over to your side. The key, the secret is to jump to his side and to understand him and to even say something like, you know, when, you, when you're facing a particular issue and he's seeing it from logic and you're seeing it from emotion, to even say something like, you know, I know you're probably seeing this as it's just, you know, the kid just got, um, uh, our kid just got a, failed a math exam that's just a fact. Why are you getting all drama and emotional about it? Uh, but I, I, I can't, I'm a woman and I'm emotional about it. So I, I hear where you are coming, you know, in other words, you're, you're, you're taking, you're seeing it from his side, acknowledging the difference, acknowledging to him. I know that your being a rock is what gives me the ability to create. It gives me the ability to be a butterfly. It gives me the ability to, to, you know, feel the winds as they're going. Without a rock, I never have manuha. I never have serenity and peace in my life. So your rockness is why I married you. You said yourself that his inner strength is why I married you and I love it. But what I want to work on, dear husband of mine, is I want to work on understanding your side better so I can grow in logic. Right now, if I were to take a test and I, I, would, get, I would flunk logic, okay? I would flunk, you know, a cold uh, calculating data facts. I would flunk it. And probably you would, you'd probably feel better, just say that even if it's not true, you'd probably feel better if you went to my world and were a little, you know, more emotional because you seem to, you know, uh, uh, understand sometimes where I'm coming from. But I want to understand you more and grow more logical. On the same token, I'm hoping that you'll work on understanding my emotions more. So I'm going to give you an example, dear husband, that when I am telling you that something's upsetting me and you say, that's your problem, go handle it, you have to know that the Hazal have told us, our Masora for Shalom Bias, for peace in the home, our, our tradition of peace in the home is that a man is responsible for his wife's emotional well-being. It's his responsibility. That's his, his, that's his, her emotional 
serenity, her emotional, well, serenity, I don't know if you could even control that, <laughs> okay, because women are not <laughs> serene, okay, but her emotional, her emotional balance, her emotional, um, he, he's responsible to listen to her problems and listen to wishes, uh, so he, because he has said to you several times, you know, it's your issue, you handle it, if you were to come back to him and say, hey, it's your responsibility, what is anybody going to want to do when you tell them what you have to do? You know, what you should be doing. They're going to reject oh, it. Right. it. Like defensive, yeah. totally defensive. So you, uh, you, the way you handle this has to be done with kid gloves, has to be done very, very carefully. That's an American expression, um, you know, meaning very carefully, walking on eggshells. You have to handle it extremely carefully. But the job of a woman is not to wag her finger and tell a husband what he should do. The job of a woman is to milk it out of him to 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 charm him into wanting to do what he is obligated to do so that the first way to do that is for you to jump from your world of emotion into his world of logic to acknowledge it to praise him for it to thank him for it to thank him for bringing such stability and logic into your life and to um, when he's talking about something and he says, oh, well, we need to, you know, uh, get rid of that old crib. that has got a broken arm, you know, hinge and uh, whatever. And we need to get a new one and get rid of that. And you're like, oh, let's just keep it. Can't you hammer it together and whatever? And he's like, what? Like, it's broken. You can't have a broken crib. And that, that for you to acknowledge that, you know, I know you're right, but you have to understand where I'm, I'm coming from the emotional side of it. That's where all our babies slept for the, the first two or three years of their life or five years, depending on the kid. You know, they, that's where they slept. I'm such an emotional ta attachment to this stupid crib. Oh, I didn't realize that. But you know, honey, we really, it's not safe. You know, or, and okay, okay. It's acknowledging that. And once you acknowledge where you're coming from, can you see how that kind of a conversation where he's being totally logical and you're being totally emotional by acknowledging sort of the elephant in the room, the problem and, and what the issue is, that that would make you feel closer at that moment? Yeah, I think it's happened many times. We've had such a discussion where he's like being very like, clear and convinced of his perspective and when I've explained it from my emotional point, he does see my point and it, would you feel closer? That's great. So can you build on that strength? I mean, that's how relationships work, by the way. People always are focusing on the problems in the relationship and trying to patch them up. Fastest way to a better relationship? Go with the strengths. What are you doing in your marriage that works better? What are you doing? What are your strengths? What are your closeness? What are the things that you know? Uh, you know, you had said that when you're when you're at the Shabbos table, there's a connection. They're saying, when do you connect? He's at the Shabbos table. I feel very connected to him. Do more of that. Don't rush through dinner. Make extra five courses. Make edamame or you know, I don't what you know. Uh, make extra you know, like have a fish court and then have chips and salsa and then have, you know, whatever you get fat. But whatever. But I'm just saying grow the strengths in the marriage that is where the the joy is going to come from not from trying to patch up all the things that are broken and not working start with the strengths so is it possible you know in those times when that happens can you recreate that more often in your marriage it's hard because he's got a big wall around him right so have you ever talked about the wall around him with him yeah and what does he say about it? Uh, he's scared to be close. Why? What's his childhood history? He, he is lacking a lot of love and emotion. What did you say? He's lacking? Um, and he's scared to let me close. Say that he again. didn't get love as a child. He didn't get love as a child. Uh-huh. And so, so he's scared to let me in. And it's hard for me every time when I come and I get rejected, it, it's less easy to come again. Mm-hmm. Have you asked him what the best way, how he can, you know, he's not going to change overnight, obviously. I don't think you expect that. But it, it, have you talked about ways that he can learn to let your love in more over time? Like, are there little things you can do that will help ease him into it? I mean, this is, this is the work. This is the work of the marriage. This is the taking care of your husband. This is the loving him more than he will let you love him. It's not easy. And I don't know why God wants this of you, Ellie. Like, 
Hashem has, God has put you in a spot that's quite challenging in terms of, you know, having to break through his barriers and give him love when he doesn't want it, when he doesn't act for it, when he's pushing you away, when he's, you know, uh, he's not connecting with you and he's not doing the same for you. And you have your own insecurities about, you know, like you said, when you, when you uh, p- pour love on him and it's rejected, it makes you t- twice as shy to go again. So a lot's being asked of you. Yeah. A lot is being asked of you, but we know that God never asks more of us than we can, never gives us a challenge that we aren't capable of uh, 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 coming through with flying colors. So is there a way that you can work on yourself to heal him? Because you've been married for quite some time and uh, a lot of the first years of marriage, especially if, a, if a, um, somebody's come out of a dysfunctional, which I once gave a lecture, there were like, I don't know, 600 people there. I said, how many people here have a dysfunctional, uh, it, it came from a dysfunctional family? And everyone was kind of like, you know, raising their family, like, <laughs> you know, they were embarrassed. To think, but everybody feels like that. Everyone had stuff and we all have baggage. We all have stuff we've carried from our, our family of origin or families of origin. If there've been divorces and remarriages and, you know, we all have carry our stuff so your husband is carrying particular stuff and it's no accident god gave you who from just having spoken with you for this short amount of time you're an insightful lady you are a lady who is um doesn't run from a a a challenge you are you know yourself you tell things on yourself you say i can't really do that i unless i feel i feel too vulnerable you know you're honest with yourself so you have the the intrinsic qualities that you've worked on yourself or that you were born with i don't know to be able to accomplish this and to reach out but this is going to be more work on you with very little gratification in the beginning, you know, it might take years of you pouring love and healing him before you get any back. Is that right? So how can you make that, that journey easier on yourself? How can you make it so that you'll be motivated and you can keep going and not feel rejected yourself? Can you think of any ways? Any, anyone want to type in suggestions? Sarit, do you have any questions? I see you're flagging me on something. No, because I was actually having a like literally back and forth um, on Tor Anytime's live stream now with Connie. And she actually said, make sure to show Leia all the comments. I said, I know. Okay. <laughs> Leia's like, Leia has to do all her stuff and has to make sure to navigate like what's going on on show. And I'm like, after the show, I, you know, down. No, we want to know. You can't give us a teaser. <laughs> yeah, like no, that. because it's so many back and forth because they really relate to it. But one of the, what we, what we were basically talking about was the fact that like, that's what you need to have best friends for is to share all this stuff. And that most husbands don't care to know all this like day to day stuff. And I was kind of saying, but like that, I understand what Ellie's saying. Cause it's kind of sad. Cause then your husband misses out on a part of your life. And I used to find, remember, I remember this like Claire's day when you used to tell us, I would share with all my friends throughout the day with my sisters that by the time my husband came home, we really had nothing to talk about because I had unloaded everything. And you, you, you miss that because a relationship is about people sharing. And then once he knew when you made us do that homework, um, I know this isn't that show, but the appreciation homework about um, soliciting appreciation. And it was about writing down your list of accomplishments and what you did that day when I sat and I listed to him at dinner, like all the stuff that I'd done that day. And that like, because I noted it, I remember to talk about each thing. He, we had the nicest conversation. And then the next day, and then that whole week, he kept asking me, so what's going on with that? And you know, where are you holding with that? And how did that work out? And he became a part of my day. And I remembered him and thought about him throughout the whole day. that's an important part of a relationship. I feel like that, that is what, you know, Ellie's saying. And I think what other people are saying is like, yeah, you you can have best friends, but if you don't involve your husband and he makes you feel lonely, that's like where it's right. So we're bridging that gap. Uh, uh, Ellie's dealing with a a different, uh, uh, an additional issue here, which is the fact of, um, a husband not being able to feel her love because she can pour, pour love on him. And he has a, like she said, she has a, he has a wall around her and him. And it might take years of, of um, Ellie be selflessly just giving and giving and giving to him and going to his side and trying to understand it from his perspective. There is one thing that you had said, which is that you're, he feels he can't trust, you can't trust him because he, uh, 
your your father was stricter on certain um, uh, Jewish law and halacha than your husband was, and you feel uncomfortable going to the leniencies, and you uh, the, the the leniencies are completely accepted in your community. It's not like he's saying, okay, let's uh, do something, uh, 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 a sin, you know, doing something that's completely wrong. There is a very, very, he is actually, your husband is actually right on this. And I wanted to explain how this might play into it. If a, when a woman leaves her father's home, she is meant to take on her husband's minhagim, her, his, his customs and his ways and follow him. Even if she grew up in a house that was more strict and he's lenient on things, unless it's breaking a halacha, um, a, a Jewish law, a woman is meant to completely follow her husband's way. That's the Torah way. And it's like, wait a minute, he should follow my way. I don't know why it is this way. The point is, when a woman does that, for some reason, if a man started following her ways, a woman would sort of feel like he doesn't have a spine. What happened to him? He's not strong. He doesn't have, you know, conviction about his life or whatever. When a woman, for some reason, when a woman follows exactly what the Torah says, which is to follow her in her husband's ways, and he is her rabbi, and he is the one she looks up to and gets the questions for her. Okay, do we eat this in the house? Can we eat that in the house? No, can we, you know, do we do this on Shabbos? Do we do that? You know, when she, as her husband, whether he's learned, he's not learned, or he's learning, or he asks his own questions, questions to his own rabbi and comes back with an answer. When a wa woman follows her husband's ways, there is a level of stature in the husband that is not normal. Like he, he, he just, he suddenly becomes more of a man, more of a, uh, a man, but what I mean by that is strength, more, more strength in himself, more self-esteem, more confidence in who he is in the world. Um, and here's where it plays out in terms of payback to you. You know, it seems like you'd be giving up a lot. Like you're joking. I don't have my opinion. No, you have your opinion. You can say, you know, I th shouldn't we keep this? Cause my father kept that. And if he says, nope, this is how we do it. That's what the woman follows. Okay. That's just go, ask a, your local Orthodox rabbi. You know, ask a rabbi because they will tell you follow. In I have, I've way. actually been to discuss this a few times with a rabbi. Um, and he, it wasn't so clear cut because Part of the things that he wanted me to do did involve um, a serum that people are just not aware of and people choose to be nickel on, um, but it's actually something wrong. It's against halacha. That, and what did your husband say when you brought that to him? He feels there's a lot of hype about it. And he didn't take it so seriously. Mm -hmm. So then maybe have him speak with the Rav and whatever the two of them decide would be the answer. But you you don't have a leg to stand on. And the Rav, I'm sure, told you this. You don't have a leg to stand on to do opposite of what your husband wants. And if your husband gets convinced that, you know, that it is usser, um, this is a big shot. And I, I don't have big shoulders. I'm not a Rav. I'm not a Posek. So I can't answer this question as the way it needs to be properly answered. So you need to ask your own rabbi the answer. But if you were to go back to that rabbi and say, what should I do? This is how my husband holds. This is how you're saying I should hold. I don't, this is a Shalom bias issue, a, a, a peace in the home issue. Please step in you know, or get your husband to call him, get the rabbi to talk to your husband. You can't let this go and just, and, and just, you know, be okay with it, not doing what your husband is, is, you know, in terms of um, mm -hmm. running the household. He need he needs to have that. He needs to have your trust and he needs to have that control in his home. If he doesn't have those things, what happens is he disengages. And then where I was saying in terms about your payment, right. when, when a woman follows her husband and trusts her husband and puts it in his hand, even if, you know, a lot of women say, I, you know, I, I, I don't respect him. Leah, I don't respect him. And the issue is respect is not earned. It is granted. When a woman grants her husband the respect, he desperately needs like oxygen, just like we need connection like oxygen. Men need control and respect like oxygen. When he gets that, guess what? He turns around, he says, what do you think, dear? He turns around and he says, hmm, uh, he, he will reach out to be closer to you. When a, a man feels that he is not respected and not trusted, 
it's almost like he, he's given up the relationship. Like if he can't get that, anything that, that jeopardizes that, any closeness he has to you that jeopardizes his feeling that you don't respect him or that you don't trust him, he, he will disengage. So another secret aspect of this whole loneliness bit is, you know, and, and again, you know, in marriage secrets, there's a whole chapter on respect and how to, how to show respect. And, and we're not respecting because that's what you should do to be a good person. You should respect your husband. Maybe that's true. <laughs> the reason you show this respect is to earn the closeness that we desperately need. Women need that. And I know you said, oh, I worked really hard at not needing him. But when he's upset with me, I'm crushed. I can't function. <laughs> you know, yeah, this is how you earn that closeness is by respecting him. And the, the problem that, um, I get it. You want to do the right thing by God. Here's what Hazal say. Here's what our, our, our Torah tradition says. If you focus all of your energy on shalom bias and grasping that and do, you know, look, God, I don't know what to do. You know, he wants me to eat this hecture. I don't eat it. And he wants me to do this and whatever. I'm just doing, I'm just going for shalom bias. I want shalom bias. Please protect me. Suddenly they'll recall that food. God can do anything. They'll recall that food. The hecture will change the, you know, whatever the rabbi will step in. You'll go to the rabbi. If you're so, if you focus all of your energy on doing things for shalom bias, and then you, you won't, let that little uh, uh, do we keep that actually do we not keep you won't let it let it just linger and be festering you will go after it and you'll call the rabbi 20 times until you get him on the phone you resolve the matter you get him on the phone with your husband they resolve the matter and it's done so that you can go forward with strength and trusting and respecting your husband it's crucial crucial to the closeness and it's crucial to that feeling of no loneliness of yeah whatever whatever you know i don't he says this thing i don't really trust it whatever patch that up so that you can have that closeness so yeah, by the way Lynn, i know you're really literally like it. at the end um but i just wanted to tell you we began so much from all ends about this whole best friend um relationship concept and people saying that is in marriage the whole point of marriage is that a woman should build her relationship with her husband to be her best friend and so on and so forth and then somebody commented well men are useful for other things like having kids oh and killing spiders too so <laughs> i guess they have other things but i think we're gonna have to do a whole show just on literally this topic of does your husband have to be your best friend and how do you make him your best friend so just okay. remember that very good. I have a lot to say about that. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you. Stay tuned, ladies. Okay, so for Ellie, did you have anything else you wanted to say? Is there anything that you're walking away from this show that's going to be the the game changer for you in terms of your loneliness? I think I'm going to keep trying to understand that he's not doing it. This is just how he is. Um, and to just be more understanding be more willing to pour the love until he's ready to accept it. Um, and I really like that new perspective on the Yiddishkeit levels um, to say that I'll try and find out my best and basically let go and follow him and, yeah. You are so special. Oh my gosh, <laughs> Ellie. Mm -hmm. Hashem should bench you with bracha and mazel pardasa, everything good, nachas from your kinder, and shalom bias to 120, and the koyach to, to feel closer and closer to your husband every day. Thank you for being on the show, Ellie. Okay, thank you. There's Leah Richheimer, okay. for, the, there's Leah Richheimer for the Ladies Talk Show. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody, and we'll see you next time.